so pleased to have Amber Cullum as the very first guest on This Mom Knows, and I'm excited for you to get to know her too. Amber is wife to Sam, a mom of three, and a physical therapist turned stay-at-home mom. And she's also the host of the Grace Enough podcast, where she loves connecting women with God, people, and resources to spur them on in their walks with Jesus and remind them that God's grace is enough. So welcome, Amber. Thanks, Jen. It's great to be here. You're doing it. Yes, it's gone from talking about it to, oh my goodness, it's a real thing. <laughs> That's right. That's oh. awesome. I'm glad to be here for your first show. Yeah, well, thanks. Well, we're new friends, having just met in North Carolina this past summer, and uh, I affectionately call you my Southern soul <laughs> sister, <laughs> because the more I get to know you, the more I realize just how much we have in common. And we touched on a few things about you in the intro, but why don't you just take a minute and tell us a little bit more about yourself, um, your family, um, how you ended up in North Carolina, something like that. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, my name is Amber Cullum. I um, have three kiddos, 10, 8, and 5-year-old. Mm -hmm. He turned 5 in October, so he's still home. I mean, sometimes when I say 5, I feel like he should be in kindergarten. Um, I think he thinks he should be in kindergarten, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, he's not. He's home. Mm -hmm. And um, I partially homeschool my two oldest kids. That is not a quarantine event. That is something that we have done for a couple of years now. It's a university model type school where they go to school two days and then they're homeschooled the other three days. So that works mm -hmm. well for our family. Um, and so that's really what I do. I podcast and um, stay home with them, help school them. And uh, we live in North Carolina, but I was born and raised in the mountains of Eastern Kentucky mm -hmm. and lived there, went to college there, met my husband. And then we soon after we got married, moved to Florida, which is where he is from um, in Tampa and had all three of our babies and literally like Levi was born and we were moving to North Carolina. So mm -hmm. that's a little bit about how we got here. Well, that's fun. It's, it's e beautiful in Kentucky. I love driving it through is. there. So pretty. Oh, I missed it so much when we first moved. Now I'm used, I mean, it, I've been gone from there for a long time, but yeah. it really is a gorgeous place, but North Carolina, it's pretty great. It's nice too. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, there are a lot of reasons why I have enjoyed listening to your podcast. And uh, one is that you ask excellent questions and you really engage you. deeply with your guests. But another is that as I listen, I hear you really relating personally with them on so many things. And one thing that I've heard you mention, you know, several times has been that you have personally struggled with mm -hmm. depression. So let's talk about that. Um, I know you have kids. So was your depression postpartum or is it unrelated to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting now that it's been a journey for so long because I do think that I had some depression going on before kids. Um, but, you know, it's a different it was never something that felt uncontrolled, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I can identify signs now looking back. But at the time, it was so much easier to keep a little bit of your physical um, and emotional health intact, primarily because I had a job that I enjoyed. I was involved in life-giving ministry. Um, I didn't have kids, so getting yeah. in physical activity was rather easy. Um, so really, when it came about, my first son was born in 2010, and I had a pretty difficult postpartum time with him, mm. but nothing to where it didn't go away eventually in the sense of go away to where I went back to feeling somewhat normal. He was a very difficult baby, colicky. Yeah. Um, any mom out there who just thinks, oh my gosh, I am not going to live. That's kind of <laughs> how I felt with my firstborn. Yeah. Um, and that can be really dramatic for some, but if you've had a hard baby, you know, Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> that's yeah. why like this podcast, I know right. this mom knows about having a very difficult <laughs> first child. And it's a miracle and, you had two and three, right? <laughs> I mean, 
It it really is. And so there's hope for you if you think I'll never do this again. Mm. Um, Because, I mean, my oldest son is a delight now. I mean, he didn't, as people say, he didn't, he doesn't still cry himself to sleep. He doesn't still wake up, you know, 18 times a night. He's doesn't throw up every time he eats at 10 years old. So you will get through that phase. But it was after my daughter was born. And Mm. so my daughter was really my easiest baby. Mm. But my body fell apart after her. Um, Not only was I having a lot of the emotional issues, but my physical body, she had uh, some difficult times nursing with her latching. Mm-hmm. Therefore, you know, I got mastitis and then I had thrush, which is something that a lot of women just know n- very little about because unless mm-hmm. you've ever had this yeast infection as a result of nursing, you have no idea that th- the pain is just crazy. Um And so there were these physical things going on, even though she wasn't really a difficult baby. Mm -hmm. And so really it was after her um, that I realized, okay, it has been, you know, nine months and I am sitting in the floor and I am just sobbing uncontrollably Mm -hmm. for no reason. Um, And it wasn't going away. Uh, So that's really when I, I realized like something's not right. And because she was such an easy baby compared to your first, you were able to distinguish differently between what was the tired, normal, I can dismiss this kind of signs because I have a newborn versus something's not right. Yeah. I mean, and I think when it's your, when you've had one baby, you you don't really know what to expect. Um, And I, I remember having one of my really good friends from Tampa, she'd said, we, our firstborns were right around the same age and they were really, you know, good friends. They're still good friends. And she said, I just kind of always thought maybe it was something you were doing wrong because Mm. her old child was so easy. And then I remember her second child, her calling me on the phone and going, I think I have a Bennett. And she (laughs) just was like losing it because she's like, I don't know what to do. And so if you have a really easy child, you don't really know. But with Zoe, it was just one of those things where it was like, okay, four months, you can just pretty much expect your life to be crazy. I mean, even if your child's sleeping, your hormones are trying to get back into some type of normal, whatever that is. Um, But you're still just trying to get in a routine of sleep. And what does that look like? And the changes come so fast. Um, That I knew once I hit about the six month mark, like, oh, something, something's not right here. Um, So yeah, it helped. Yeah. So did you think at first, did you, did you go straight to this is depression or did you kind of go, you were just stuck at something's not right. I got to figure out what's going on. Yeah. I mean, I remember so much of, of, again, now, then I could start saying, oh, well, I've had these times before where, Mm -hmm you know, I'll be sad for a long time. And then you'll have a couple of good days. And um, I just remember thinking like, this is eventually going to go away. I I know I'm six months in and it's not going away, but I'm going to give it another month or so. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to just, you know, hang in there. Like maybe once I start exercising again a little more consistently, it'll get better. Um, Those kinds of things. I'm older now. I've had all these physical problems this time around. Mm -hmm. So it still took me a while. But um, I mean, the denial that I don't know about people, I can just speak for myself Mm -hmm. and for my friends who have experienced the same thing. I mean, it's a real thing. No one wants to think like I need something else besides my own willpower and prayer yeah, um, to get to the other side of this. Yeah. Yeah. So that went on up until about a year. Um, okay. Before I ever sought any assistance. And, and you kind of alluded to this, but once you kind of realized what was going through your mind, I mean, were you, uh, you're well, probably my all husband, over the place. My husband was so gracious, Mm. Um, you know, but he was miserable. I mean, he comes home and it's like you've worked all day and then, you know, you're walking into, I mean, basically just an eruption zone, right? Like you've got a sad wife, you've got two kids under the age of three and really nobody's happy. Mm -hmm. Um, 
not that my kids were never happy and there weren't happy moments, but it's a nobody wants to sit and listen to somebody who's sad all the time. And right. and it's hard because I know having been in that phase that that's why a lot of people don't share it. Yeah. But my husband did finally get to the point where he was like, you something has to happen. Like you you have to do something. And we had a couple of really good friends um, who the wife, which was one of my best friends, she, she had severe depression before we ever met mm. to the point where she tried to take her life at one point and her husband, I mean, had to take her and admit her. And so he had a lot of experience with this. And Sam, my husband reached out to him and said, oh, you know, what do I need to do? Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, a very good support for him to say, well, first of all, you've got to address it head on. You've got to just straight up say what you think needs to happen. She needs medication and you need to encourage her to go do that and to stop putting it off. And then also because he reached out to someone, um, mm -hmm. his wife was much more willing to really kind of call me out on some things. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for that because I don't know that I would have gone. Yeah. Well, and because it can be a very lonely thing to walk through. Like you said, you know, you can be hesitant to talk about it because no one wants to listen to somebody, you know, going on and on about it. But it sounds like you were kind of um, not backed into a corner, but you were surrounded by support before you even realized you needed to reach out for support. Yeah. I mean, I thank God all the time that really the situation we were in at the time, it was one of God's tender mercies towards mm -hmm. me in my life because my husband is not the type of person that would just come up and point that out and finally um, say, okay, this needs to happen. And he didn't come to me forcefully and be like, basically, you need to go on medication and you need right. to go see somebody. But instead, it was like, hey, you know, we have this is not normal for you. Mm -hmm. We know somebody who's walked this path and they couldn't get through it on their own either. And so I'm just so grateful for him knowing me well enough to yeah. talk to me, but also that he had the courage to reach out to a close friend, um, which we knew a lot of their journey, even though we didn't know them when it happened. Mm -hmm. um, we were very, very, very close friends, kids the same age and things like yeah. that. So um, I do. It was a tender mercy of the Lord. Absolutely. On both sides. It, it, it redeemed yes. her situation yes. <laughs> to know she could help you and encourage yes. you that way, I'm sure. Uh, so, um, so you went, so you had support from your friends, you went to a doctor, you got on medication. Yes. Um, and did that even things out? Did you still have to do counseling? What, what got you through or from coping and surviving back to thriving? Yeah. I mean, once we, I finally said, okay, I'm doing this. And so I made an appointment and I went to a doctor and I finally just was like, you got to let some of the stereotypes go. You've got to let some of the fears go of what people will think, the embarrassment, the, um, you know, all the things that we go through that it's easy for us to blame that it's stereotypical. And so you don't want to get help. But the reality is our own flesh struggles with that too. It's not right. just the way it's perceived by the world. That has a lot to do with it. But we struggle with it because we want to think, me, mm -hmm. I shouldn't be saying we, I should be talking about myself. I wanted to think I could overcome it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a Christian, you do have to wrestle through, is this me not having enough faith? Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't in a situation where people were saying things to me like, oh, just pray harder. Oh, mm -hmm. just read more Bible verses, memorize more scripture. I feel very fortunate that I wasn't in that situation yeah. um, because I think that shame can add a whole other layer Absolutely. to how you feel. But I was putting a lot of it on myself because mm -hmm. I felt like I knew I... I knew I was perceived by the Christians around me as being a very strong believer, mm -hmm. um, a very strong follower of Christ. And so you have to wrestle through that, you know, in your own mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so once I finally went and said, I'm going to get on medication, I still was like, but I'm not staying on it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'll take this for a little while and then I'm going to get off of this. Mm -hmm. But I learned a little bit more about 
the way your brain works. And it's interesting because my background is physical therapy. And so I do have medical um, background. I mean, I've mm-hmm. had neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. And so I don't know if I just had forgotten in my mommy phase, but like <laughs> when hormones like serotonin and things like that, when you have a deficit in that, mm-hmm. you don't just regain those types of things, but instead you can k- do things to keep them at the level where they are now. So it's not like you can just, um, I don't know how to describe it, but let's say you had a hundred percent of something mm-hmm. and you went down to 90%. Well, from that point forward, you can only get back up to 90%. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. You don't necessarily go all the way back up to full. Mm-hmm. And so that was something that the, um, the um, psychiatrist that I saw said, you know, I just want you to be aware of this. It's once you start taking this, it is something that you will need in order to keep those levels up. But then she was so gracious to explain why we need that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, I went on the medication and knew it would take a couple of weeks, but it was an extremely low dose. And honestly, the the change was so fast for me. Um, And I often described it as before I felt like I would walk into a room and there could be a hundred people and I'm an incredibly social person. People make me very happy. Um, Well, most people. (laughs) (laughs) I I like to converse with a lot of people. That's what I should say. (laughs) But I would, I mean, it's like I would be talking to multiple people and I would feel all alone and it didn't Mm. matter what someone would say what someone would do, how people would respond. I felt like I was the only person in the room and nobody else knew I was there, even though there were hundreds of people. But afterwards, like it was like that, that fog, that cloud, that um, what felt like this little barrier around me Mm -hmm. went away. Um, And then I wrestled through some things of feeling like, well, now I don't have any emotions. (sighs) I feel like I'm emotionless, like nothing okay. makes me cry because I mm. am a very, um, <laughs> as you can tell if you're watching this, I mean, <laughs> I have a lot of emotions, both mm. positive and negative. And so um, it, it, I had to wrestle through that. But yes, it cut the fog. It allowed me to get past that place of, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get out of this. It allowed me to start seeing um, things from a positive viewpoint again. And so, of course, mm-hmm. then the journey after that was very long, but the medication originally helped a lot. Okay. And are you still on medication, can I ask? I am. Okay. Yes. Yes. So you've just said this is part of what gets me back to that 100%. Mm-hmm. And that's okay because it's no different than taking insulin for diabetes or, you know, vitamins, you know, iron deficiency or anything like that. That's right. Well, and and I wrestled through that too. I remember when my third born, when I was pregnant with him, I did not have to come off medication. I, the kind I w- I take, mm-hmm. it's a very low dose. And so I can continue taking it while pregnant. Um, but I just decided I'm going to. Okay. <laughs> and so I did. I mm-hmm. came off medicine and I was like, oh, maybe I won't need it, you know. Mm. But yeah, that just wasn't the case. And so that was another layer that you you have to work through. Um, mm-hmm. You know, again, it's this it's getting past this guilt, this shame. Um, what does God believe about me? What's really true versus mm-hmm. what am I putting on myself? Yeah. What is really true versus what other people are putting on me? Or what I perceive other people are putting on me? Mm-hmm. And so... I worked through that again. And once I decided I would start back on medication at that point, I knew I will take this for the rest of my life. Okay. Um, and now it's just, yeah, I yeah. mean, that's and just so what I do. You're on the medication. It's what you do. And the depression is, it's just not who you are anymore because it's, you've worked through all the things and I'm sure it re- rears its head every now and it then, does. but it is not, you don't walk around going, <laughs> I'm Amber and I have depression. You go, Yeah, I'm Amber and, you know, depression's been part of my story. Yeah. And I mean, depression still is a part of my story. Mm-hmm. It is still something. I mean, just today, uh, my oldest son was having to write these poems about every single person in our family and one mm-hmm. person um, either in our extended family or that's a friend. And so he has to come up with these descriptive words as he's brainstorming. And then when he gets to me, um, 
we're working through all the different ones. And I said, well, you could write feisty. And we look up feisty and I'm like, oh, I don't think that's a, that's, <laughs> yes, I am feisty. But when you look at the definition, <laughs> yeah. it also means that you're looking for arguments. Um, mm. it's, it's, there's two different definitions. And, and my oldest son was like, well, that's not you, mom. I'm like, and I mean, I can be argumentative, but I don't just walk around looking for arguments. Right. Yeah. yeah. But um, my husband had said, I said, why don't you go up and ask dad? I feel like, you know, I've been able to help you with all the other people, but you go ask dad. And Sam said some positive things, but he also said, and she can really get focused on the negative really quickly. Mm. And so that is part of a couple of things. I mean, I definitely grew up in a family where I would say we were more grumblers. And so while depression can be somewhat, you know, it, there are, there is proof where it can be genetic. Mm -hmm. um, it can also be things that wounds that we've experienced in our mm -hmm. childhood that has done, um, you know, some damage in our brain. And so the, the way that our brain functions tends to be more of that woe is me, mm -hmm. but a lot of that can be reversed. And so while it's still something that rears its head on a regular basis, I can think in compartments. So I can think about, you know, we have the spiritual self, the mm -hmm. emotional self, the mental self, and the um, physical self. And I kind of know when I'm getting depleted in certain areas, yeah. I, I know that the things that kick in now when depression comes up mm -hmm. um, or when it it's raging. Um, and so because I know some of those things, I can say, okay, do I need to get outside um, and treat my physical body mm -hmm. better than what I've been treating it? Have I been active enough? Because mm -hmm. those are the things that release those hormones that are sure you know, make us happy and joyful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I think about the emotional health, have I been in life giving conversations with people that I love, um, people that love me, that pour into me? Or am I putting myself in situations right now where I'm just being depleted constantly? Mm. Like I know I can ask those questions now and figure that out. I mean, same with spiritual. Am I actually communing with the living God or am I just checking my boxes? Right. Because if I'm checking my boxes, then I'm kind of out of whack there. And I know like, oh, maybe that's part of the trigger that's getting ready to send me in this downward spiral. Sure. Um, so yeah, I don't, you know, I hope that yeah. helps someone, but it's mm -hmm. really hard when you have a newborn because you, you can't put, you, you're, you're not depleted to everywhere. To out those boxes. <laughs> yeah. Cause you, you have to kind of get to, right <laughs> everywhere. And yeah, you've got to get past that because yeah. your hormones, you can't really control that early on. No, but yeah. now, I mean, it's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you are the host of the Grace Enough podcast. And it sounds to me like that shift in mindset of, you know, growing up in a grumbling home and, and these types of things may, was that part of what had you say, I want to start seeing where God's grace is, where the goodness yeah. is in, in things around me. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it really contributed to why I started the podcast, but I will say when it comes to the title of the podcast, Grace Enough. Hmm. I do remember um, I went, I did go to counseling, not after this depression came on, but back right after college to work hmm. through some issues in my relationship with my mom and to deal with some of those things. And I really did a lot of studying on the grace of God during that time and just hmm. this unmerited favor, like I cannot earn it. I have been saved by grace. You have been saved by grace if you believe, you know, in Christ. And that is not something of myself. That mm -hmm. is not something of my mom. Um, we don't earn this. And so when podcasting came along and I really thought about that, it was, you know, God really can use any story. If you're someone who is walking through depression right now, if you're someone who grew up in an abusive home, if you're someone who grew up thinking, oh my gosh, my life is perfect. Um, we must be doing everything right. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden you're realizing that's not true. Mm -hmm. Like God's grace, if you surrender and you trust him, he will use your life. Yeah. He will 
you can impact his kingdom. I mean, and so while depression maybe didn't lead to the podcast or like um, my experience with that, Mm -hmm. definitely working through what grace really means um, and why that's important. Yeah. Played into that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I love on hearing the stories that you talk, you're looking for people are sharing the grace in the yes answers to prayer and in the no answers to prayer. And I, it just struck me the other other day that it's so easy to focus on the yeses and the this, but the grace is there equally in the no's. And sometimes the no is grace, (laughs) you know, but um, yes. Yeah. So if there's, there may be a mom listening today who is, who is struggling with depression or wondering if she might be, um, what would you tell her? I know you're not a counselor. I know you're not a medical professional in that specific yes. sense, mm-hmm. but mom to mom, what would you tell her is a good starting point to just sort of help her discern if, if that's what she's struggling with and, and the first yeah. steps to change that? Yeah, I mean, the first question I would ask is, are you in a place where the majority of your day you feel trapped? Mm. And I'm not talking about trapped like, oh, I'm a parent and I don't get to do the things I used to do. But I mean, do you find yourself sitting in the middle of the floor and weeping at times uncontrollably and really not knowing what you're weeping over? Mm. Um do you get that feeling where you walk into a space and you should be happy, but you're just like, nothing, nothing makes you feel um, excited to be there, excited to be a part of it. And and it's not all about feelings, but this is certainly something that will help you identify if you're experiencing depression. Mm -hmm. It's almost like this darkness that's just over you and it's indescribable I mean, if that is you, um, you probably are struggling with depression. And I would say you're not alone. Um, God sees you. God knows your heart in a way that nobody else does. And even if you're crying out to him and you feel like he is not answering, the fact that you're maybe listening to this and considering right now that it might be you is him Mm -hmm. answering. Yeah. Yeah. Because it doesn't mean that when we pray and maybe God doesn't take away our pain or our sadness or our sorrow, it's not really that God's not answering. You know, sometimes it is through that person who comes along and says, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. And that triggers in you, oh my gosh, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Or validate. so (laughs) that's right. Listen to Mm -hmm. that still small voice and don't push it down and find one person that you feel you can trust and say, I'm struggling. I know I need help. And then you just have to take the next step to, to get the help. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not easy, I know. So if you don't have that one person, Jen will put up all the things. Please reach out to me because I didn't want to tell anybody. Mm. And sometimes it feels easier to tell someone you don't know than it yes. is to, to be vulnerable with somebody you do know, especially if you're not sure how they're going to react. Yeah. And it was years before I told so many people that I take medication for depression. Years. Mm -hmm. Even after some people knew it. I I mean, it's totally normal to feel like something is wrong and you don't want to admit it to anyone. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing where, you know, realizing that God knows every intimate detail Mm -hmm. of who you are of how you feel, how you're wired and what's going on with you can bring comfort Mm -hmm. because he already knows he is not sitting in judgment over you, over these feelings. Yeah. And so just ask him for one person that you can talk to. Yeah. Well, that's very good. Um, and that makes this seem like a really awkward segue because we're near the end of our conversation. And now I go to a very lighthearted question, <laughs> which That's is hard because opposite. Jen, I'm sorry, I talk too much. <laughs> no, it's great. I, I well, The first time I heard you say, actually, that, you know, you are on medication for depression. What 
I heard and what I saw and what I loved was that you were so confident in who you are and who God made you to be that this was just a fact. It wasn't a definer. It wasn't a um, deficit. It just it just was. And um, so hopefully that encourages you that Thank it you. just, you know, it, it really was encouraging because yeah. um, it can be tricky with, uh, especially in it the is. church, it can be very tricky. Um, it's a mixed bag. So sure <laughs> yes, yes. It took so. me years to get there though. So people need to know it's not like I just arrived right. here. No, but your journey may help them get there faster. That's right. So that's right. Yes. I hope yeah. so. Yeah. Well, as we draw to a close, um, one fun question that um, I'm asking every guest because I am a gadget person and I like the right tool for the right thing to save time and effort. So yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite gadget? Okay, I'm going to go as fast as I can because I have to say one thing first. Today, I oftentimes when I'm looking over stuff like this, I'll look at my kids when I'm not sure about something and I'll be like, I'll ask them the question, what do you think? Yeah. So I look at my kids and I'm like, what do you think one of my favorite gadgets you know, is, or wait, what's the proper um, English there? Yeah. And um, both of them look at me and go, your computer. And I'm like, yeah. that does not count. <laughs> I'm like, does that mean you think I use it all the time? And, and thankfully they were like, no, no. But, and I said, but it, it's for work. Right. And they're like, oh yeah. You know? And so I started laughing. I'm like, I got to tell Jen that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we came up with, because I mean, I'm kind of a gadget girl, but not, not really mm -hmm. my frother, uh, my little, it's, you know, nothing fancy. It's battery powered frother for my coffee in the morning. Uh huh. I mean, I really do enjoy my coffee more since I've had that. And I think I've had it for about a year now. So I think it's my favorite gadget. Oh, well, that's great. That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fun. Oh, well, Amber, thank you so much. How can people connect with you where they can, where can they find you? Well, if you want to listen to the podcast, I am pretty much anywhere. Um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, you know, Amazon Music, all the places, just search Grace Enough Podcast. And then I hang out on Instagram probably the most. Um, that is Grace Enough Podcast underscore Amber. And really, that's what it is everywhere. Facebook. Okay. Um, so you can find me in those places. And I will put all that in the show notes as well. Thank so, you, Jen. Well, Amber, thanks for sharing. And uh, thanks for being here and kicking the whole thing off with me today. Well, I'm excited for you and your journey. <laughs> <laughs>